Welcome to Metaphysics, Morality and Mayhem. Most philosophers have thought our account of the world must precede our conclusions about how we should act. Metaphysics before morality. Now in an era where there's deep puzzlement about what the overall framework might be, it begins to look as if we need to know what we want to do and achieve before we can decide on what account of world we might adopt. Should we put morality first? and decide how we want to change the world before framing our theories to understand it? Or is this profoundly mistaken and a quick route to conflict, division, and chaos? Well, with me to discuss this, I've got a great panel to explore what is a deep and fundamental question. Uh, Simon Blackburn is a leading philosopher in what is sometimes known as the analytic school. He's written many books, a number on truth and also on morality, both, of course, central to today's debate. And he describes himself as being a quasi-realist about meta-ethical issues. And no doubt we'll hear further from him what he means by that in today's conversation. Joanna Cavana is an award-winning writer and acclaimed novelist, and her novels are wide-ranging and structurally adventurous, including Inglorious and The Field Guide to Reality, in which uh, a philosopher has put together a vast compendium of thought to fix existential angst. The book, however, has gone missing, and all the characters are trying to find it. A metaphor, no doubt, for this debate. And Raymond Tallis, who, following a successful career as a physician and clinical neuroscientist, has metamorphosed into a prolific writer, having published, I think, more than 20 books on wide-ranging topics from poetry to philosophy. His latest, Seeing Ourselves, Reclaiming Humanity from God and Science, was published earlier this year. Now, in the usual way, I'm going to give uh, each of them three minutes for their overall response to the question, must we decide our morality uh, in advance of framing the theories that we have to understand the world? So, Simon, we're going to kick off with you. It's all yours. If we start with the everyday, um, we're all capable of making descriptions about the world which owe nothing to our moralities. Um, I'm sitting in a room, I've got a television in front of me, there's a carpet on the floor, a light over there, it's a sunny day, and so forth. And my senses give me that. Um, I, maybe there's an interpretation of my experience going on. In fact, nearly all philosophers would say there is. But the interpretation doesn't, on the face of it, seem to owe anything to morality. Um, you can't tell from my description of my room whether I'm a, uh, a great fan of Boris Johnson and a passionate defender of Dominic Cummings, or, or whether I'm quite sensible. When we look at higher-level scientific theory, it's also very difficult to see morality getting into it. I mean, if you look at the great um, quantum theorists, Einstein was left-wing, pacifist, um, Heisenberg was not, uh, Niels Bohr was different again. Uh, they all had their moral and political differences, um, but they all agreed about science. So it's very difficult to see that the high-level theories of that kind, and those are the best we have, um, owe anything very much to morality or politics. Well, of course, they owe something to politics in the sense that if the political situation gets bad enough, uh, the science stops being practiced as it had hitherto, and that was the case, of course, in Nazi Germany. So, um, so I think that the um, initial answer, and this is why I was a bit puzzled about the question, the initial answer I'm going to give is that the, um, the ball is in the camp of those who think that morality does uh, inevitably affect, infect our, our best theories of the world. Joe. Well, so, um, as you said, Hilary, in your opening remarks, there's kind of a suggestion that where formerly we might have contemplated the world deeply and the world of universals and then worked out what to do, um, now there's a concern that many people don't hold a belief in a religious universal view, so how do we act? And do we then reverse the whole thing and we decide we're just going to act and stop with the contemplation? Um, and I wonder if it's all that neat, if it was ever a case that there was on one side absolute that existed beyond language 
and on the other side, um, these contingent mores, because even if the super beings are present and you know, we can't know for certain they're not, then do they use human language? Do they use our concepts? Um, and the concepts themselves are deeply rooted in human lives, in contingent realities, metaphysics, doesn't originally mean, as we understand it, something beyond the physical world. It comes, we think, and we don't know for certain, but some poor editor in the first century BC trying to deal with Aristotle's work. And he suggests um, some of the works might be filed as ta meta ta physica, the ones after the ones about nature. And from this, we have this wonderful change through history as language changes, and we now have a different sense but equally morality again if we try to cite it in the world Cicero may have been the first person who coined it um, again he's trying to translate from the Greek he's trying to go into um, uh, trying to translate ethicos um, and he reaches for a word we don't know the origin of a Latin word mos um, which in its plural form means mores the customs and so we're within the contingent world all the time and language changes in time it changes its meaning words aren't these stable absolutes and they're not gifts from um, a realm beyond language that sounds very paradoxical um, so i think the question though you ask about foundation and how to act is really crucial though um, because if you're going to act in a reality you do need to have a kind of sense of certain questions that have a partial or contingent answer what is the reality that i'm dealing with in some sense you need to answer that and who am i that must deal with this reality um, and again to answer them absolutely you need to be eternal and omniscient you need to be in all realities at all times um, so we can't do that but there's a danger then we end up very discouraged. We end up like Bartleby the Scrivener who can't do anything. Um, or we end up uh, like Merceau in L'Etranger who thinks because everything's meaningless, you can act without meaning, you may as well. And he kills a man for no meaning. So there's great peril and importance to this question. Um, and to offer one, I'm running out of time, but to offer one very, again, to use the word contingent, possible answer. Um, there's another novel by Camus which is highly relevant to today, uh, La Peste, The Plague, which he publishes in 1947. And in this, he gives his most interesting character, Rieu, a possible answer to the question, the two questions really that I posed. Um, what is this reality? Well, it's a plague and people are suffering appallingly. And who am I? Well, Rieu is a doctor and he has a relative role, a very important role, in that reality to save lives to reduce suffering and he hasn't answered the vast questions of what is everything but he can act he can act in this tragedy and in a sense Camus saying because he has this role he is in a sense a fortunate man so I mean that I think we're in a certain amount of existential mayhem whatever we do because of these very strange and uncertain conditions of our existence but I suspect we're trying for the least mayhem for ourselves and actually for others. Words create worlds and I think also change in relation to the world. And I'd say actually, though I don't really have time to advance this, philosophy is a kind of art in this respect, borrowing a bit from Iris Murdoch, who borrowed a bit from Wittgenstein, um, because it does precisely that, it creates these worlds. Thank you, uh, Joe. And uh, uh, Ray, do you, uh, do you want to put your point of view, please? I mean, as a non-professional philosopher, I've often been disappointed by the lack of connection between the most interesting parts uh, of philosophy, metaphysics and ethics, how they don't connect uh, in, in any obvious way, rather, as Simon said. Um, and this, of course, as again what Simon said, it, it's a contrast to religion, where an account of the fundamental nature of the universe is inextricably connected with the way we should behave, mediated through a god. But on the other hand, it's one of the glories of philosophy, that it's not in a hurry to be useful. Its curiosity is boundless, and the way it pursues its inquiries is not compromised by the desire to find a solution to the parochial problems of how human beings should get on with one another. And it's perhaps important to understand why this failure to connect ethics and, let's just say, metaphysics is not an accident. We have to remind ourselves what metaphysics covers. Its boundaries are fluffy, of course, but most philosophers would agree uh, that it deals with fundamental things such as space and time, the stuff of the universe such as mind and matter, causation, necessity, substance, attributes and so on. 
And you don't have to have a clear idea of what these are to conclude that they have little or nothing to do with morality. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.